record this session. Um, and so we're now recording um, so that we can also have this for trend. Sorry, um, let me share my screen again. Almost forgot to record this. Yeah. Okay. So, and then therefore we we set up this talk, and I hope to keep it as an informal conversation. So, if you have any pressing questions, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, but please then unmute your microphone and say something because I'm not seeing the chat window as it is now. Um, and I'm planning to do like a couple of questions during the talk as well, so that we can interact. And so my plan is to do maybe like 30 minutes talk and then we have more time to chat later. Um, and then we can go close to an hour in total duration or a bit more if people are interested, okay? So today we're gonna talk about open science and how we challenge scientific barriers with open source and open science tools. Uh, if you never heard any of these terms, don't worry, we're gonna introduce them and hopefully it will become quite clear. And I hope that by the end of this, you'll be interested enough in this topic to dedicate some time to search for things that are useful for your research. Uh, of course, um, open science is such a broad thing that I cannot possibly cover everything here. So I'm trying to not go into much details and give a broad overview, but still keep it interesting enough um, that you'll be able to find things for yourself afterwards, okay? Um, so I already said hello, but hello again from my side. My name is Andre. Um, I'm a research bioengineer at the University of Sussex in the UK. Um, I work for the Department of Neurosciences and I have the privilege of basically dedicate my time into building open source tools and tools that are where all the designs uh, of the things we develop are freely available for anyone to download. And to uh, sorry, Andre, to interrupt, your volume has suddenly gone down. Ah, okay, sorry, just a second. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a bug on my computer. Is this better now? That's okay, Andre. Yeah, great. Okay. So. Um, <laughs> basically, I get to build tools for a living and build research tools for so that researchers can have a better or an easier time doing their own research. I'm also the open source coordinator at Trend in Africa. Um, which means I'm trying to Whoa. contribute to the NGO by um, basically uh, sharing what we do at the university, but also running courses and um, trying to teach people how to use open source tools like we're doing today. Um, I'm also the founder of Open Neuroscience, which is an open repository for, um, sorry, for open source neuroscience projects. And I do some consulting in a company called Prometheus Science. Um, all of these are links. You can find them uh, in the presentation in the link that I shared. Um, and so let's get then to it, right? This is enough about me. And so today we're gonna see academic barriers and practical issues currently in science and research. And then we're gonna see some open solutions. Some of the things we do in Trend in Africa is open solutions. And then also we have time for questions and, and some answers in the chat, okay? So just to start off, and I'm sorry to start on this space, but I think it's good to frame the problem that we have in research today, right? So I, I and me and many people identify uh, three main problems with research today, right? First of all, it's cost. So how much money you need to have to be able to access the tools and the literature, all of this shuts a lot of people out of research. Um, then lack of access. So even if you do have the money, to buy things, right? Let's say you raise money to buy a microscope and you are in a place, some, a country in Africa or a place in South America where I'm originally from and I experienced this, you have the money, but then you buy something, it comes from North America or Europe or Asia somewhere and it takes forever to arrive, gets stuck in customs. If it breaks, there is no supply for it. There is nobody to fix it and so on, right? So this lack of access is also not good for science. And even when all of these things are taken care of, our last problem is the fact that sometimes the results in a paper are irreproducible. And this is not what science is about, right? If you see a result in a paper, you should be able to easily reproduce it. And we're gonna talk about one, each of these and how open solutions and open source are uh, trying to tackle all of these problems, okay? 
So just an example of costs, let's say you're gonna start your research, it's your first day in the lab, you're trying to read a paper. Um, what you see if you're not in an institution that actually has signed for a specific um, journal, you're gonna find this paywall, right? Like you're gonna see a, an image showing you how much it costs to read an article and or to subscribe to the journal. And this is quite expensive. Um, and this is also done for articles that are really, really old. So for instance, science still charges access for articles from 18, from the 1800s, which is absurd because they have like nothing more than historical value by now, right? Um, then just to have you, to give you an idea, is not that these costs are high because it's really, I mean, it is expensive to run these journals, but also the editing companies are making a really high profit, right? So here you're seeing a paper from 2015, which is showing the operating profits in millions of dollars um, over the years. And this is uh, around <laughs> 1,200 million, you know, like a billion dollars basically for some journals, for some, for some editing companies back in 2015. This is in the same range of oil companies, pharmacological companies in the automobile industry. And if you think that a lot of what they're selling, the papers comes from public funding, it's absurd that they managed to get away with this, right? This is the first, one of the first problems in access uh, of research. Right. And then you talk about software, then you have the same issue. If you, if you want to access a piece of software that is, um, that is needed for your research, it's also quite expensive. Um, and even when you do have access to this software, because they're black boxes, you, can, you cannot see like how the code that generates them is, is written and what exactly they're doing. You still have this problem, which I'm showing here is a paper that came out in 2016 where the researchers have shown that the gene name that come out in papers um, are wrong a lot of the times. So you can see on this table here on the right, a paper that like 30% of the papers that come out in nature, in the supplementary spreadsheets, they have errors in the, in the, in the gene names, right? So basically this happens basically because people, let's say use Excel to do their analysis or to store their data. And Excel is not made to store gen gene names, right? And therefore, um, what happens is that Excel automatically converts that weird string of numbers and letters into something else. And then you get a gene name error in your paper, right? Um, an overall average of 20%. And then you can imagine if you're a PhD student that you're dedicated your whole study to learn about one gene, you could be studying the wrong gene for a long time, right? Um, and so this is, needless to say, this is quite bad. Uh, and this is one of the issues of not having software that is designed for the task at hand. And we're gonna see how open source software helps e uh, tackle this issue. Then the last thing that I wanna talk about today is equipment, which is more of my specialty. And I wanted to show here uh, one of equipment which is, is, I guess, known by everybody in life sciences, which is a microscope, right? So the modern microscope um, has a design from around the 17th century, so 1600s, right? Um, and the design hasn't changed much. Of course, we have better optics, we have a better system, but it's still the same principle, the same technology. This is one thing. The other thing is um, as you can see here on the left, this is a, a design from the 1920s, and on the right is more of a modern microscope. The issue with this uh, equipment, as I mentioned, I mean, they do wonderful images and they're paramount for research, of course, but the issue is that right now, the way they are supplied to researchers, they're made by few companies that are normally in the global north, um, and which only have laboratories that are in the global north as customers in mind, right? So they are designed to, to need a constant power supply, which is not necessarily always the case. They're not designed to be used in the field. Um, they don't take different climate uh, situations in mind. And if something from this breaks, as I mentioned, and you are, let's say in South America, you won't be able to get a replacement part anytime soon or get anybody to come and, repl and repair your microscope, right? So even if you do have the money to buy it, um, 
you're going to have a hard time keeping it running for a long time. And so this microscope here, which is just a simple optical microscope, costs about 5,000 pounds, which is a lot of money. Um, and then you have all of these issues that I mentioned. And so taking all of these things together, you would think, okay, but then if I am in the global north and I have all of this money to do research, then I'm going to make excellent research and all of this is going to be reproducible and it's going to be wonderful, right? Unfortunately, this is also not the case. Um, and there are papers coming out showing how there are flaws in the studies coming out, even in very, very high prestigious uh, journals like Nature, right? So in 2016, there was a, uh, um, an article that came out that had a really, really big flaw in its statistics, and it was teared apart by people when the paper came out. I think it was even retracted, if I'm not mistaken. But basically, um, what you're seeing here, the quote here in the bottom is just showing, if you read Nature's guideline back then about what they ask reviewers, is that they ask reviewers to look at the statistics of the paper if there is time available which is really absurd because statistics are a very important tool to know whether or not something is actually true, right? Or if it's actually statistically significant and therefore an effect to whatever, what you're studying. Um, this is not only true for this one isolated case, there was a big reproduction um, experiment that ran in 2015, where a bunch of different laboratories tried to replicate 100 studies from psychology field, and over half of them failed to reproduce the results, right? So if you think about that science is based on reproducibility of results and repeatability, this is terrible. This indicates that a lot of the papers we read are actually showing an exception or something that was in a statistical fluke than an actual effect. And so, again, this is just to remind us what I started saying, like if you put all of these things together, the way we're doing science right now with these secret things where we don't show the code for the analysis, where we use software, which is not properly designed to do what we want, and we're using very expensive equipment, which is not easy to repair or easy to calibrate, is leading to all of these issues. Right? And then I keep telling everybody nothing good ever came from secrecy, except for surprise parties. So science needs to be more transparent. And this is the whole purpose of open science and open source. Right? We, we try to develop trust and, and reliable results by transparency. And we're gonna see that in a bit, yeah? Did anybody have a question? Yeah. Can you repeat, please? No, Andre. Yeah? Come is again. it possible to mute the rest of the participants? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, and so enters open source, right? The opposite of this secrecy and all of these issues with um, and um, these things where, yeah? Can you repeat, question? please? Repeat, Sorry? come again. Come again, there's a network right. error. Right, so here, uh, let me just go back one. Let me just see, yeah. So we're having this issue, or I'm showing you that there are issues on the way we do science and how there is a movement coming and has been working for a number of years in different institutions around the world to make science more transparent and more reliable, right? And all of this basically, from my point of view, stems from the idea of open source, which is the idea where everything we create for science and everywhere else, is basically shared. So basically, let's say you did a study in ecology and you analyzed your data using some custom written software, right? What you're gonna do when you publish your paper, you're gonna write everything you did, but also share the codes that you use to analyze your data and also share your data, the raw data, so that people can either do a different analysis or recheck your analysis or learn from your analysis and so on. Right, and the word open source is just a way of saying this and saying that we're gonna have a couple of uh, licenses um, that are gonna show us how to properly share these things. If you think about it, we normally tend to share things with our close contacts, right? So if you have a, a nice, I don't know, like cake recipe or recipe for a lunch that you like a lot, you normally tend to share this with people that you like. And, and people that are close to you. And the idea of open source is exactly the same, but you just use a certain 
number of guidelines to make sure that everybody shares things in the same way so that it's easier to reproduce everything, right? So for instance, even this presentation, the template uh, is on this link where I'm showing here with the red arrow, it's an open source template for this uh, design of the presentation, right? Of course, the content is mine, but the template and how the design is, is also open source. Um, in the real world, I think that there was a, a, a piece of news that came out in 2018, I think, showing that 78% of companies around the world run on open source software, and less than 3% of companies don't use any type of open source software. You have a link for the source here, you can check this out later yourself, but just to say that this is already being used massively by companies in the real world, uh, outside academia, um, and so we should start picking this up as well. So the idea of open source is because all the code and designs are freely available, so you can just download them from the internet, the costs are much lower because everybody knows like how much it costs to build something, how much it costs to design a software and so on, right? Because everything is freely available and you can just download designs and change them to what you need in your own local reality, there is no more, or there is a very, very reduced chance of lack of access. And then again, because all the designs and everything is freely available, um, there is a much smaller chance of things being irreproducible because you can reproduce things to the smallest details because you have line by line, for instance, what a certain piece of data analysis code did, right? And I hope this will, if this is not clear yet, uh, I hope this will be clear over the next few slides. And then if it's not, please interrupt me so that I can try to explain it in a different way, okay? Um, so it's based on total transparency. Everything gets uploaded to the internet and you can see everything in its minute details. And there is this, this saying from, uh, open, from the open source community, which is given enough eyeballs, all problems become trivial, which means if you have enough people looking at something, then big problems become something easy to solve, right? So it's power by transparency, trust by transparency, and trying to implement this idea that research and science should be a collective and, and, and a community effort and not an individual effort. Um, for publications, as we started talking about them in the very beginning, there are many, many um, open access publications nowadays that basically do not charge users to read and also preprint servers, uh, which is basically once you finish the first version of your manuscript, you can simply upload this to a preprint server and people can already read it while you submit it for review, right? So this is great to get feedback. This is great to get your, word out, your work out there very fast before it's even out, uh, sub, uh, before it's even published in a journal somewhere. These are just some examples. I guess interesting for this community is also the middle one here, which is called Africa Archive, which is basically <laughs> focusing on research that is related to Africa, but also research that is done by African researchers trying to highlight uh, their work. Um, and so these are just some, some of them, there are many more, but the whole idea behind this is that you can um, really inspire increase the speed into what your finished project gets out there. Because if it's in a preprint server, people can read it. And there'll be a big sign on the preprint server saying, this is not peer reviewed yet. So people need to be critical about what they're reading, but still it's already available out there. Um, so um, this should then be available much faster than it would normally be in a normal peer reviewed journal. Um, and so moving on, we have then software. These are just examples of open source software. And this is where a point where maybe I would like to ask two questions. The first one is this concept of open source clear so far or are there questions? I'm happy to take any type of question about this. This is absolutely fine because this might be new to a couple of people. So it's really important that this is clear so that we can then go on to the rest of the talk. Um, and so if it is clear, then, oh, 
sorry. Then we can go to the next question, which is, can anybody write maybe on the chat, um, what kind of research you're doing and what kind of data analysis you do? Are people hearing me? Yes, Andre, we can hear you. Ah, okay, because some people are saying that they are not. We can hear you. Ah, okay, great. Um, so, <laughs> would anybody like to share on the chat what kind of um, research and what kind of data analysis they do and what kind of software they use to do data analysis? Because I would like to show that we can find most likely an open source alternative for that. Is everybody having access to the chat? All right, so Sorel right here on the chat that they use for statistics and climate data, they use RStudio, right? So RStudio is a great example of open source software, um, which is basically a, a package for the R programming language, which allows people to have access to a lot of libraries that are able to do a lot of interesting analysis on data without the users having to code everything from scratch, right? So you don't need to be a software engineer to be using R. And it's actually something that is going to empower you to do more complex analysis without having to code all the analysis yourself, right? Does anybody want to give me another example? Maybe somebody's using Excel or something else to do data analysis? Okay, so in the case you were using Excel, one of the things you could use is R again, uh, but then I'm gonna show you more options. Um, and so I'm sorry, like I'm reading a couple of the comments here. Sorry if this is a little bit too fast, I can try to slow it down. It's just, yeah, uh, I didn't see this because I'm not having access to the chat while I'm presenting. So I'll try to make it a little bit slower uh, and we can then definitely clear all of the questions by the end uh, of the talk, okay? Um, so as I said, right, like these are just some uh, pieces of software to do data analysis and to do other things. They're mostly focused on neuroscience, which is my field, but this is just to give you an example of the diversity of tools that are available out there. Um, and so for those of you who are just getting started, I would recommend one of these two, these two uh, tools that I'm showing you here, if not both of them. So one of them is R on the right side, which you already mentioned. So it's in a statistics and plotting language, which you can use for really uh, high quality plots and integrated, it's an integrated environment and it's easy to extend. And there are many, many available libraries that people can use uh, to, do all sorts of analysis, right? Um, on the left side, what we have is Python, which is an open source general purpose programming language. Um, Kelvin, do you wanna uh, ask a question? I see that you raised your hand here on the on Zoom. I cannot hear you and I don't know. Okay. So maybe if you have a question, um, either write it on the chat or ask it now, if you can, please. Okay. So um, as I was saying, Python is a general purpose open source programming language. And there are so many libraries for it that you can do everything with Python from controlling hardware, so controlling laboratory equipment, to doing web development, to doing data analysis, to doing a lot of different things. And it's one of the most sought out 
after programming languages by the industry at the moment, right? So if you are um, a student that you're thinking that maybe academia is not for you and you're gonna leave academia, learning Python during your studies is also very helpful because then later if you wanna to go to the industry, this is a very useful tool to have. Um, so then we come basically to the final and point where I want to dedicate a little bit more time because I think it's going to be the most changing for everybody, which is open source hardware, which is also what I do on a regular basis um, at the university in my specialty, so to say. Um, so basically what you're seeing here, it's um, four examples of open source microscopes. Um, and each one of them, like all of them have the common point that they're under $500. Some of them are under $100. And each of them has a specialty basically, right? So here on the top left, what you're seeing is a... Um, is an open source um, microscope that we developed that is specialized for neurosciences and state-of-the-art neuroscience methods. On the top right, it's something to do fluorescence imaging with bacteria. On the bottom left, this is something called open flexure. It's a microscope um, that is, as you can see, a 3D printed microscope and is able to do malaria detection. So actually the group that is developing this is a big group between researchers in the UK and in Tanzania. And they're all working together to get this tool to make automatic malaria detection. Um, and on the right side is something called miniscope, which is a very, very small, very light microscope that is light enough to put on top of a mouse head and get images of the brain while the, animal are, while the animals are behaving. Um, and so you can do experiments with the animals behaving in a box and get images of their brain activities while they are in this box. Um, and we're gonna see a little bit more about this in a bit. Uh, just about this microscope that we published, this is also related to the work with TREND because this started actually in one of the summer schools that we ran uh, back in 2014. But basically we showed that with a hundred euros, um, you can actually build something that does state-of-the-art techniques in neuroscience. As you can see here, um, I'm sorry, this is missing a uh, um, scale bar, but this is a larva of a zebrafish, which is about maybe two millimeters. Uh, and you can nicely see the vascular system working um, and the beating heart here, um, close to the animal's head. Uh, then we show in this paper that you can also do something called optogenetics, which is another neuroscience technique, which is also quite state of the art. Um, this is the same, this is also zebrafish larvae showing a uh, green fluorescent protein in its heart. So this little green beating thing here is um, the heart of the animal. Uh, this is something that we deployed in over 50, like we have already heard of people building them. So there are at least more than 50 different units out there in the wild, in museums, high schools, high schools and universities. Um, so this is to make the point that A, these things are, people are reproducing these tools. B, uh, it is possible to reproduce them in your local setting. And C, this is also good for, this is also good career-wise, right? Because we got a paper out of it, it got reproduced. And interestingly, uh, there was a researcher in the US that contacted us recently that they're building something similar called PySpy. Um, please mute themselves because uh, we can hear you laughing. And this is, yeah. Sorry, let me just see if I can fix this. Um, yeah, sorry about that for all of the other people. Um, so back to the presentation, then basically they adapted our design to work with ants, right? So now they have a system where they didn't have to start the development from scratch and they have something much faster than they would if they had to. And we didn't have to develop this different version of our system to work with ants. And so we're both winning, um, so to say, and there is a paper about this coming out soon. Uh, of course, in trend, we 
uh, also teach this kind of things. And so we published a paper in 2015 also showing how we do these courses and how um, things are running with trend, right? And so we've been training people in this idea of building their own tools and leveraging open source technologies um, to uh, build their own equipment. Here you can see some photos from, from these workshops. And I think we're now reaching a good point of how we adapted these workshops over time. That what I'm showing you here is a paper from a group in Ghana that was part they were participants of this workshop and they took the prototype they started in the workshop and brought it all the way forward into a fully working system that then they later published in a peer reviewed journal. All right, so now there is technology from this group in Ghana made by them locally known uh, for a box that is able to measure activity uh, of rodents. Um, this is, of course, not only related to neurosciences. I want to show another example here, which is something that I find quite interesting because this is the first of its kind uh, pitfall trap. So if you're doing ecology, you probably know this, that um, you have a little bucket which is below the soil and animals, arthropods and other animals fall in there. And then you can know what kind of animals are in that region. So basically this um, author here, they published this, which is an upgrade of this system, so to say. So basically what it is, you can see here in B, this has 24 wells and it's connected to a motor. And you can see here and see how it looks on the outside. This whole box in A is below the ground here in C. Um, and basically this motor is connected to a timer that rotates once an hour. So basically now what they can do is that for every hour of the day, they can know which animals fell into the trap in each well, right? And so they can know the habits of the animals in terms of if they are in the morning, if they are in the afternoon, if they're in the night, walking about and so on. And so this is also the power of these designs that basically are also creating tools that were not previously available to do your research. So your research questions become much easier to be answered because you can modify your equipment uh, to do the research that you want and not have to do the research that is only available to the equipment yes, yes. you have available. Um, we also published a paper last year showing how these open technologies can be used to, for rapid response in many situations. So it's much faster to develop these things. And what we did was a review of all the people building open source hardware uh, to fight COVID challenges. So face masks, respirators, um, sanitizing stations and all these kind of things. Uh, I'm glad and I'm happy to say that a group from Nigeria that we're working in collaboration with actually took this to heart. And they just released a preprint showing how they use 3D printing and local tools to build uh, face masks and face shields for the local hospital, for the local community, and for the research center they were in. Uh, we're now trying to get this under review to get published in a peer-reviewed journal. So the point I'm trying to make is that all of these people that I've been showing, they are also not engineers by training. They started out as me, as they are biologists that learned and picked up all of these things from tutorials and other sources in the internet. Um, just to make the point again on the economic savings and costs, and this is close to the end of this presentation, there was a review that just came out recently from a researcher in the States. And basically what he found was that if you're using open source technologies, you can save at least 87% um, when your sourcing equipment as compared to your regular proprietary, not open source tools, right? Some of the savings are large enough to actually use the money that you save to fund personnel at the university, right? And on top of all that, it also adds on to all of the things that I've been saying, which is you can increase rep rep reproducibility. You have a more modular system. You can customize it. You can use these tools for education. So basically, um, if you um, have these tools that are, let's say, $100, you could possibly source a couple of them and not just one so that you can actually put it in the hands of students 
And during their undergrads or in the graduate studies, they can actually uh, have practical training, which is not necessarily always the case, right? And the last point for this that I would like to drill down is that now, if you're able to build your own tools, your research projects are mostly limited by your imagination, right? Because um, we can build the tools to answer the questions that we have and not be limited by the tools that are available. I hope that makes sense. Um, and so one last example is for the mini scope that I mentioned before. So this came out recently. So basically, Daniel is one of the main developers of the Miniscope, and they actually have built since 2016 about 2,500 of these, right? Uh, and they and what he says is that since that time they've been saving around um, 200 million dollars in public money if people were buying the same tools commercially available, right? So you can imagine like the scale of this, and so how fruitful this is for the proper use of public fundings, right? And then he also goes on to add that not only they're saving money, but then publications that were using these open source miniscopes get published at the equivalent rates of people using commercial devices. So there is no difference whether in the quality of the science that these devices are making, right? Or helping develop. Um, just to show you, that we're having a huge increase in the number of open source tools being developed. So what you're seeing here is the number of publications per year of open source tools and a couple of events that were landmark in the subfield, right? So basically in 2010, we barely had five of them. And now in 2019, the last data point was we have more hundred of them for the year of 2019. Um, and so there is like a really an acceleration of open source tools. And so the community and researchers are really, really starting to use this. And so there is no point for you not to do the same. Uh, there is what I call a Cambrian explosion of designs. These are just a couple of examples. An atomic force microscope here on the top left. Below it, and it's, a, it's a robot for delivering drosophila food into vials. There is a computer cluster here in the bottom right and many other examples. Um, if you want to learn more about this, I put all of these links and logos here for places where you can start to look for help and look for information. So I won't mention all of them, but just what I think is really worth a shout out is that there is an, an Africa open science hardware community that is of people all over Africa developing tools for research, um, which is, I think, completely worth a look. And you should find a link if you Google for it. I can also share it on the chat. Uh, this is just a little overview and a bit of a, a very short view of all the things I said today. Uh, and with that, I would like to say thank you for your time. And then we can have questions now and you can always contact me either on Twitter or via email. And I'm happy to really answer as many questions and as many uh, things um as you may want to ask thank you thank you andre maybe i can start it off yeah um for someone doing basic work uh using a microscope and you want to um develop an open source microscope Mm -hmm. In simple terms, how would yeah. one go about doing that? Right. So I think the beauty of this, this idea of open source is because there are so many designs available online that the starting point would be to find the open source microscopes that are available online and see if one of them fits what you need or close to what you need, right? Because as I mentioned, for instance, there is open flexure, right? So if you're doing uh, histology and pathology, open flexure would be the most close to what you need. So you would just need to follow the building instructions that are available for open flexure online uh, to build one of those, right? And so you wouldn't need to develop it yourself. But let's say you want to do something that open flexure doesn't do, but it's quite close to. You would again, start by building an open flexure, understanding how it works, and then adding or removing parts as you need it 
to do exactly what you want it to do. Does that make sense? Yes, Andre, thank you. You're welcome. Are there any more questions? Uh, sorry can i <clears throat> can i also say something andrea yeah sure hi <clears throat> i'm also gonna open my video very quickly hi guys so my name is samira and i'm the coordinator of trend in africa and i don't know if everybody was in the beginning of this talk when we started um andre is our open source coordinator and he and Hannah are working very closely with a project that we have that is called online collaborations. So all of these can also be uh, giving a quicker one-to-one -one, um, meeting if you guys are interested and if you have an idea of a project that you think that you first would like to know more about what kind of equipment there is already uh, ready and open source that you can look for it. So I think I will ask maybe for Hannah to then uh, give some more information. I also will put the link. So if you guys want to have a little bit of um, a one-to-one -one time with anyone, uh, because you have a project that you think you would like to share with one of our co uh, collaborators, we can do that for you. So the idea of this talk started because Hannah said that she was very, um, I don't wanna use the word impressed, but she was she had no idea about all of this. So we wanted to make sure that more people would know that Trend is doing a lot of advocating for the open source, especially the open labware. So this is why um, we don't, we're not hoping for everybody to know everything and leave this talk oh, I, I know what I want to build, but maybe just give you guys a little bit of um, information so you can look through it and come back for more questions. If you don't have the questions now, it's great. Uh, I'll also share on the chat my email so you guys can send me questions and I'll follow up with Andre. If you also could please maybe change your names for the, the people that have numbers, it would be super hard for Andre to reach you guys. So could you just please put your names on so he can just call you directly, okay? Um, I'll just go back to Andrea if you guys have any specific questions. Thank you. Thank you. So I already shared the link uh, to the online collaborations form. So please have a look if you're interested. As Samita said, we're always uh, looking for more projects. And also I shared again the link to the presentation I just gave. And in there you can have as I showed in the last slide, there is information on how to reach me. Um, and again, if you have questions, I'm happy to take them now. I hope this was not too quick and was enough clarity for people to understand at least the general idea of what uh, we're trying to do. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, I had a question about uh, the testing for toxicology or the toxicant movements uh, within the body of an organism. Mm -hmm. For example, Swiss scientists, we are told that must to be there always to guard the lives and not to destroy the lives. So I was wondering, why should we be testing uh, the movement of toxicants in the bodies using the animals uh, besides other techniques? So is, is there any other alternative to test for this? Um, let me see if I understood the question and let me know if this is wrong. So you're asking if there are alternative techniques to testing the, toxic the, the toxicity of components it is not using animals. Is that correct? Definitely, that is the question. Okay, so 
So there are um, definitely in vitro studies for toxicity of certain components. This is, unfortunately, this is not my area of specialty. Um, but for instance, I would say that you could have, let's say, microfluidic testing and things like that, right? And for those, I'm pretty sure there are open source projects that show you how to set up a microfluidic testing system. Um, or even with cell culture, maybe, right? So you could cultivate cells of a specific type and see if a compound is uh, toxic to that group of cells. And there are definitely open source projects that are showing people how to do cell culture, right? Um, yeah, and so maybe this is a general point. A lot of the things that I did when I started uh, in this field some years ago was to actually just Google for open source, the term open source, and then whatever it is that I wanted to find, right? So maybe let's try that now, because this is a good way, like this is a, actually a very good way to start. Um, let's just try this. Just give me a second. Um, so let's see, open source cell culture, right? Which is what we're discussing here. So here, right? So there is a publication, um, the first thing in Google, right? That shows me an open source 3D printable bioreactor for tissue slices uh, as dynamic three-dimensional cell culture models. I don't know if this is exactly what you want, but it's a starting point, right? And so apparently we can have access to the article. Hopefully we won't hit a paywall. Um, right, but here, like, this is artificial organs journal apparently. Um, and hopefully we should be able to get a PDF. Yeah, so I don't have access to this because I'm currently working from home. Um, but you see what I mean? So you can start by looking at these things, right? Uh, or even what I mentioned, microfluidics, right? Um, here, so this was out in nature, actually. Uh, or, yeah. And this is open access. Um, and so this is describing a whole system to do, or at least talking about microfluidics and how people are doing this as open source tools. Right? And you can see designs and things like that. I hope this complements the question. Yeah, it does, definitely. Okay. Uh, one more question about the topic that we have had today about uh, uh, the computer programming so that are used in the study of maybe uh, the scientific field. Mm -hmm. I've heard a question about this. How could I maybe perform a programming about uh, to test for the visibility of a chemical within the body, rather than just using a micro uh, a microscope. Is right. that possible, or there is another way I could do that? Mm. So there are two things here, right? Initially, if you want to do any type of image acquisition or any type of data acquisition, you're going to need hardware, right? So you're going to need a piece of equipment which then is gonna give you data, which then you're gonna analyze. And this is where the software comes in mostly, right? Both to control the equipment and also to do the data analysis. And so depending specifically on your need, I would start again the same way, Google for what you need, try to find the equipment, because if you have access to that, then you can um, see if it's possible to build it locally, right? And I guess this then goes in line to what Samira was saying that we're happy then to see how we can connect you with people that might have the knowledge to help you through this process because it's a complete new field, right? I mean, as much as I would like, I wouldn't possibly be able to help the different 80 people there are in this in this Zoom room today, right? So we have, we have in train a, a network of volunteers um, that would be able to support um, some of these applications. And so just to go back to your question, uh, 
you always need a piece of hardware to collect data and then the software would come to do the data analysis, right? If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there more questions? Really, don't be shy. If you want to ask anything, anything at all, this is a good time to do it. Uh, there is another question. Yeah. If you could hear me then. Yeah. There's uh, this question about uh, the LC50 and the LD50. Uh, which are the levels for toxic uh, when you are doing the study of uh, chemical toxicology? So I was wondering how could they determine about this? What is LD50? How is it uh, measured? If uh, at all you're looking at uh, a specific chemical or toxicant within mm. uh, the biological system. Uh, when the lecturer explained this, I didn't get it so clearly. So then would you please explain to me how this can be done? Either using an instrument, maybe. Right, so I'm sorry that I won't be, help, be able to help you that much with that question, because as I mentioned, right, like toxicology is not my field. And I really don't know what LC50 and the other things are. Um, and so maybe somebody who has more knowledge on this can help you at some other point. Um, uh, maybe Andre, if I can chip in, maybe the, the question that he's asking, are there yeah. any open source equipment that you can use to measure the levels of toxic compounds in an organism? Aha, uh -huh, there, madam, you are. You came so correct. Thank you. Okay, so uh, what is the name of the... Um, is there the name of a specific equipment that you already used to do this or that is used on the field? Not really. I don't think they're there because normally these are tests that are done on animals. And right. then uh, you determine the lethal concentration at which 50% of organisms die off, which is what is called ah. the LC50. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Now I get it. Um, so this was what I was mentioning, right? So there are... This, this goes into a very, very long standing debate about animal use and the systems that we have to uh, make the number of animals used in research smaller and the models, right? So everything that is toxic to an animal or to humans is gonna be toxic into different organs and in different levels, right? So the best we can do today is to do, let's say, a cell culture of liver and say, okay, this compound is toxic at X level in this cell culture because the cells in a histology assay then start to look like X and Y, right? Like they start to look sick. Let's, let's say, let's call it like that, right? But this helps you indicate why this is toxic, but it doesn't help you in the sense of in the global aspect of the organism, how toxic it is, right? And so the, the way I understand it, unfortunately, there is no um, equipment that would allow you to completely substitute um, these tests on animals to know whether something is, is toxic or not. But what people are using are things like what I mentioned, right? So you're using cell cultures, and you're trying to use uh, other assays um, to see like the how the chemical components bind to specific molecules or to proteins in the membranes of cells without having to use animals, right? But even in those cases, you're still not able to 100% substitute the animal use, as far as I know. I hope that that answers your question. I definitely are. Yeah, and so what I what I would suggest in those cases, if you're really interested in diminishing the animal use for these assays, try to find papers that use cell culture to do toxicology studies, see what they've done and see if they're able to then reduce the number of animals, right? 
And then if they are, the second step would be to establish a cell culture system in your lab and in your department, right? I don't know if this is already available there. It might be already. And so this would be easier. But then, and this is the point where then you can use open source hardware to establish the cell culture, right? Cultures, hopefully. Do we have more questions? Or I hope this answers your question. It definitely it has. Okay, and great. I'm quite satisfied with that. Great. Um, are uh, there any other maybe, questions? Yeah. Maybe before <laughs> could, uh, I uh, mute myself. Would you send this video to the YouTube so that we could get it? Or how could we access the video of the first uh, discussion about yeah. the topic you had to present today? So we are recording this, and so we upload it to YouTube. And then um, I can basically send to Hannah, and Hannah, I hope, can um, send via email to all of you again, Hannah, if that's OK. Yes, Andre, that's fine. OK, yeah. then there you have it. <laughs> uh, <coughs> one last question. Yeah. How could I reach you maybe personally using my 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 phone or rather my laptop either through email, Twitter, or other social media <laughs> platforms that I could access you? Right. So on the presentation and the link that I shared, you have my email, right? So you can reach me via email there. Okay, fine. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your welcome. cooperation and helping me understand more that I had not understood it, and maybe. In the Collins, first. you can also, sorry, I just, before you go, if I, you can also just send um, an email to info at trendinafrica.org. I put on the chat with like questions or even a project like we said, and then Andrea would find someone that has a similar type of research than you to actually have more of one-to-one -one talks. We are having a group from your university that has a person and they are having a really good experience with this collaboration. So really take this chance guys to think about projects that you want to have collaboration with any <clears throat> with a research from anywhere in the world. And this is what we're trying to promote to you guys through this talk is that we have this network of I think 75 researchers from around the world from different fields that they are really willing to take a few hours of their weeks to have one-to-ones with any of you guys about research, about questions of your research to just even from the start, middle or end, it doesn't matter where you are. If we find someone that have the same field that you are and have the time, I don't think they will they will have any problems with that. So please send me an email and then I can help you guys with more. Uh, and then at some point also Andrea will touch base with you all. Uh, okay, fine. Uh, sorry for being a disturbing student anyway. <laughs> You're not disturbing, man. Do you have another question? Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, now about uh, about uh, um, uh, this research you're talking about, how can it uh, be performed? Maybe you said that maybe I could, do a, I could have a research that I want to carry out, and maybe I need some help. So how can I start about it? Uh, what could I send to you to inquire for? Or if, just uh, explain to me more about how to do uh, that right. research where to start, where to go, and how to finish body. Right, okay, so this is, yeah, definitely our fault because we didn't like go over the basics of this program. So everything started with the pandemic, right? So with Trend, we did a lot of projects that were um, in Africa and we used to fly people there and do long two week, three week long workshops and people would then learn and, and apply things in their, back in their institutions, right? But with the pandemic, we started an online collaborations program. And the idea is 
if you have a project, something that you need help with, right? Let's say you did all of your PC50 essays, but you don't know how to analyze the data, right? This is just a, like just an example, right? Uh, you would um, go on the link on the chat that I sent to fill out a form that we created for this project, for this program, where you would write, okay, my name is this and that, I work at this university, I have a PhD or I'm a master's student or I'm a bachelor's student, doesn't matter. Um, I have this group with me and we want to uh, analyze data on P PC50 essays, right? And we don't know how to do it and we want some help. Then what happens is that we as Trend, um, we basically find from our network of volunteers, somebody who knows how to analyze this type of data and we put you together, we put you in touch. All of this is online. So basically over a Zoom call or over emails, you start to collaborate and work together. And then the amount of time you dedicate to this is completely up to you and the person who's collaborating with you. Um, and so um, this then leads to this online collaboration system where Trend matches a project, your project with an expert in the field, and then you start talking and collaborating. Um, I hope this makes it clear on how this happens. And so the beginning point, the middle point, and the end point are completely up to you and the person who's collaborating with you to, start, to decide. What we hopefully, or what we were expecting from what we are expecting from this is that this becomes a fruitful collaboration that could potentially last for many years, right? And hopefully when, COVID allows travel again, then people could actually go either to Africa or people from Africa can go to where the collaborators are and actually visit each other and do in-person collaborations. We actually do have a lot of experts who are also in Africa. So this would start an intra-African collaboration, which I think is also very interesting. Um, but yeah, I hope this, this answers your, your question. Um, I think, so somebody who has the name of Oppo A53 would like to ask a question. You just wrote in the chat. You can either unmute yourself to ask the question or you can just write it on the chat if you want. That's absolutely fine. Hello? Is that person still there, maybe? Yeah, he has his uh, hand raised. I don't think he can unmute himself. Uh, hold on, let me just see. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, now his name is John. Uh, John, would you like to ask a question? Uh, hold on, just give me a second. Maybe I can unmute you from my side. If you'd like to ask a question. Here. Yeah, I cannot unmute you myself, but you can either ask on the chat or just ask us uh, by unmuting yourself. If anybody else has questions in the meantime, you can also ask them. Yes. Ah, hi. <laughs> hi. Uh, for example, uh -huh. you, want to form, you want to formulate a drug. Yeah. What are some of the factors you're supposed to consider and to come with before uh, formulation? What do you mean? I'm not sure I understand the question. So, if this is specific to drug development itself, this is again, like not my field, right? Um, and so I'm here really trying to show you things about the tools and the methods that would be used to do all of this and not exactly like the core questions about uh, drug development itself or toxicology properly. 
but what was was that was that your question how much or what was your question i'm sorry i don't think i understood it yeah it's okay okay uh excuse me yeah you are just uh for example mm -hmm. you are working with a hplc machine mm -hmm. and uh, the auto sample fails to, to inject the sample properly mm -hmm. And, uh, can someone, can an analyst inject the sample manually? Right. So this is an excellent example. So I, I also don't know a lot about HPLC machines, but we do have people in Trends Network that do. Right. So they would be much better fitted to answer your question. And so I would highly, highly recommend you write an email to Samira in info at Trend in Africa. So that you can actually um, put you in touch with people who can help you with that question. This is exactly what we want the online collaborations program to work for. Fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there more questions? Hello. Hello. I'm Dorfkes. Hi. We can't hear you very well. You can't hear me? Just a second, because I think there is some noise coming from another participant. Can you try to do it to ask now your question? Okay, I'm saying my name is Dorfkes. Hi. Hello. Hi, too. Hello. Hello. Hello, we can, we hear, can you hear you. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It's not a question, uh -huh. but just to help out my fellow friends whom I'm seeing, they have quite a number of questions. I'm glad to say that uh, I'm a beneficiary. I and my some fellow colleagues of mine and I, through the help of Samiria, um, We've got to meet an expert who is helping us out in our project. And we are finding it really fun and we are learning a lot. So I'll just urge them for them to be fun. They will consult Samaria, give out their project just as we did. And they will get an expert who will help them out and it will be much more easier. So thanks to online collaboration of Trend. We really appreciate it because we have come a long way and we are heading far. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's excellent feedback. We're really happy. Are you to guys hear that. talking with Aaron? Yeah, we are talking with Aaron. Yeah, we're also very impressed with Thank his work. You. It's very good to know that this is working so well. Great. Thank you for the feedback. Yeah. And how can we reach that Aaron? You're almost so, Thank you. So not Aaron everybody. <laughs> so Aaron is already working on this okay, specific maybe project. To answer that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe to help him out. We got Aaron. Um, he's an expert who is helping us out because of the kind of project we had. So I think um, with trend after giving out your project, they will find you a suitable expert will help you in your project or in your field of study. Aaron is just an expert who helps us out because he's an expert in our field of ecology. Exactly. So he's okay. the right Maybe person for project. That. No, that's the thing. Aaron is the right person for their project. And we would like to maintain this one-to-one -to, -one, uh, to each project have their own expert. Um, it might be that he could also just indicate someone else, but we really need you guys to send us the project. It's important for us because we want to have everything documented. Every work that we do, we want to make sure that we know what are the projects that people are working on. And if someone else join us in the in the network of being a collaborator, we can also just send this all this information. So for us, it's very important that you go online and the link that Andres sent on the chat, we will send it again um, before we finish 
so you guys go through and you answer the questions that we have. That would give us an idea of what you're working on. It doesn't have to be uh, something completely new. You can already describe your project and where you are right now, if you are in the middle of it or if you are at the end, but it's just, we need to know what you're doing so we can find the right person for your project. Maybe let me just share and show like what the form looks like. Thank you. Yeah, and this will be become cool. easier, right, yeah. to understand. Um, so here, the link that I shared and we're going to share again leads to this page here, uh, which is a Google form that basically describes um, what the project is, the eligibility criteria, and what we want, right? So basically, we want information about the participants. And you should try to be a group of three people because this really helps. We've learned from experience for the continuation of the projects. So basically, you're then just going to fill out very simple information about yourself. First name, last name, male or female, where you're based, uh, what was your main area of research, and two emails for us to contact you, your highest degree. It doesn't matter uh, if it's a bachelor, or master's, a PhD, or other, where you got it from and a CV, a short version of your CV. And then the same for the two other people in your group. Um, and then later we just want the motivation ladder. And here we describe what we want in a motivation ladder uh, and a little project description. So let's say your project is about, again, finding alternatives for the use of animals in toxicology, right? Uh, you would then say, look, my project is uh, alternatives to PC50 assays using open source hardware, let's say, right? And then you're going to describe it. Like, we use too many animals in research, and therefore we want to find an alternative, and we would like to do this using cell culture and open source hardware. Please find us an expert that could help us with that, basically, right? And then you're going to tick the boxes into which project areas these, these are, right? And then if you have links to the project, to things that are already available online, you would add them here and that's it, right? Once that is done, then we as Trend, we find from our pool of experts, somebody to help you out with that. I hope that makes sense. It's good. Yeah. Okay, um, are there any other questions? We got no question. Maybe just to ask, where are you from? Which country are you from? What you does? Maybe that. Okay, so I'm sorry if I didn't say that in the beginning. I'm originally from Brazil, uh, wow. but I've been living uh, in Europe and now in the UK for a couple of years. Uh, and what I'm doing is I am actually developing open source equipment risk equipment tools or research equipment sorry i'm developing open source research equipment for the department of neurosciences at the university of sussex here in brighton in the uk wow. so yeah this is why i spend so much time talking about hardware okay it's good we knew, we know about you how about madam samira uh, I'm also from Brazil. I also at the University of Success, but I am at the university at the moment. Uh, I'm working with Trent since 2015, and three years ago I became the general coordinator. Hmm. Uh, yes, that's it. Not I'm not a very interesting. I don't. My background is very very boring with business, but I think. Uh, Trend is doing a great job, and this is what why I decided to start working full time at Trend. Okay, thank you. And are you sure you are from Brazil? <laughs> My passport tells me that. <laughs> okay, and anyway, I look like a Brazilian. Thank you. <laughs> we have all the shapes and colors in Brazil. Don't worry. Brazil is a big melting pot, man. Like everybody looks Brazilian, actually. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, it was nice meeting you guys. Thank you so much for the delivery. It was nice meeting you as well. Thank you for the questions. Hopefully are there any other questions? And hopefully see your projects in the online collaboration projects yeah. as well. Definitely, I'll have to send. 
Thank you. Another really nice feedback on the chat. Yeah, from Julius. He's also in the same group as Don Kazi. <clears throat> yeah. And I think, okay. yeah. Are there any other questions? I think this is that moment when we say, ask now or forever hold your peace or contact us later via email, yeah. actually. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so yeah, so if there are no more questions, I would like to thank everybody for taking the time in their day to listen to us and for your questions. And I hope this was useful. And with that, I would like to then officially close this unless Hannah wants to say something before we close. Uh, thank you, Auntie. Maybe uh, Dr. Franklin is the chairman of our department. Most of mm -hmm. the students are from that department. Franklin, if okay. you can hear me. Thank you guys for the space. Hopefully when everything becomes a little bit safer again, we'll be able to visit your university. We're very keen to go into different countries in Africa and actually see how much we can help in on site but I do believe that the online collaboration is a great tool to actually have different experts working with your students and as close as we can right now so please tell all your department to to join us with this project because I think everybody will get a lot from it thank you very much and you're much welcome uh, thank you, Samaira. Uh, Dr. Nyaga, if you're on, Dr. Nyaga, if you can hear me. Yes, Hannah, I can hear you. I hope everybody can hear me. Yep. Yes, yeah, please give um, a vote of thanks on our behalf. Yes. Um, um, I don't yeah, know, want to, uh, know what to say right now, but, okay. but I'm extremely grateful for, for, for Trent. Uh, we are very uh, excited as a department about, uh, and, and, and as a university about this collaboration. Um, but um, um, we, we hope that we go far with this. Um, um, and and um, we, we have a, a huge pool of postgraduate students, and of course, also undergraduate students who can benefit from this. Um, uh, as a way of uh, um, giving a quote of thanks, I want to thank the, 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 um, uh, the facilitators, uh, Andre and, and Tim. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the World Trend team and, and, and everybody who made this possible. We, we are very excited about the, the, the possibilities that lie ahead for, for, for our university and our department. Um, in, in these collaborations, the possibility that the, 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 the possibility actually that you could actually um, um, a collaborator for your unique kind of project through trend. Uh, and we hope that through trend and through the collaboration that, that, that some of us do not know that the, the University of Embu has, um, has an MOU with, with, with trend. So with this MOU, we hope that we'll be able to achieve much and our students are going to really benefit like our plant ecology students have, uh, master's plant ecology students have benefited in, 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 this, in, in this collaboration. So thank you very much to Andre and Tim, and we look forward to, to, um, to, to much more engagements. I'm, I'm sure from this talk, you're going to be receiving a lot of um, requests from uh, postgraduate students and, 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 and even undergraduate students on, on um, on, on different projects that I want to, to get collaborators on. And thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I guess this um, ends our session. Thank you again, everyone. Uh, Hannah as well for setting this up and, and for encouraging your students to apply. Um, and Samira as well and all the people in Trent and all of you again for taking the time to listen to us. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Have a nice Samira. day. You too. Bye. Hannah, Bye. please, let's talk Bye. more soon. All right. Thank you, Samira. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. oh my. Wow. Oh, my God. Oh, thank you. Oh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.